get this started. Thank you. Welcome to the meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Board being held on Monday the 26th of July 2021. For those present in the room, in the meeting room, if a fire alarm sounds, please leave the building by the nearest exit and proceed to the assembly area in the car park. The agenda papers and other relevant information for this meeting are available for public viewing on the Herefordshire Council website. The Council is streaming this meeting live on the Herefordshire Council YouTube channel and is making a recording. To ensure that recording quality is maintained, please speak as clearly as possible and keep background noise to a minimum. Please ensure that mobile phones and other devices are turned to silent. Others are permitted to film, photograph and record our public meetings, provided that it does not distract the business of the meeting. If there are any members of the public present who do not wish to be filmed or photographed, please raise your hand now so that any such person filming or photographing may be made aware. Um, in relation to the procedure and etiquette for the meeting, only board members present for the meeting may vote. We have a number of people in attendance as virtual participants. Can I request that they use the raise hand function within the system if they wish to contribute? To ensure that those watching the live stream or the recording know who you are, can I ask each person to introduce themselves when they are invited to speak during the meeting? Thank you. So we'll now come to the first item on the agenda, appointment of a vice chair person. In the absence of the chair, Councillor Crockett, I move the first item of the agenda to appoint the vice chair person. The council's constitution requires that one of the board members representing NHS Herefordshire and Worcestershire Clinical Commissioning Group will be appointed vice chair person annually by the board. Therefore, I call for nominations for either Dr. Ian Tate or Simon Trickett. Tate. That's a nomination for Dr. Tate. Is there a seconder? Second. So we have two nominations for Dr. Tate, so I believe that's unanimous. We need to have eight. I see, right, sorry. Um, Okay, so can we have a vote then on Dr. Ian Tate, please? Thank you. That's unanimous, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Tate, you've been appointed as the vice chair per person for the remainder of the municipal year. Please, can you take your place as chair for the remainder of the meeting? Thank you very much. And um, I'll try and make sure I speak loudly and clearly. And um, uh, if there are any matters that people want to ask, um, uh, you know, in the room or on uh, the screen as we go along, uh, there are uh, ways in which you can raise your hand and become part of the meeting. Uh, from this angle, the, um, the, your images are quite small, so I'm going to be working with Jen on my right, Clark, to the council, who's going to be just uh, checking to me who has their hand raised. So if there's a slight time delay, I'll apologise now. I'm thanking you for putting your trust in me to um, remain as vice chair for the rest of the um, council year. So thank you very much. Um, if we could move on uh, down the agenda then to agenda item two, which is apologies for absence. Have we any apologies for absence? Uh, yes, Chair, apologies for absence have been received from the relevant board members, Councillor Crockett, Cabinet Member Health and Adult Wellbeing and Chair of the Board, Councillor Tyler, Chair of the Herbishire Community Safety Partnership, Chief Fire Officer Jonathan Price, Herbishire Community Fire and Rescue Service, Simon Trickett, Chief Executive STP ICS Lead, NHS Herbishire and Worcestershire CCG, Mark Yates, the Chair of Herefordshire and Worcestershire Health and Care NHS Trust, Judy Grant and Hayley Allison of the NHS England and NHS Improvement, uh, and Richard Ball, the Director of the Economy in Place. 
For officers, we received apologies for absence from Mandy Appleby, the Assistant Director, Adult Social Care Operations, and also Neil Taylor, the Interim Director of Economy and Place Heritage Council. Thank you very much. And if we could then move on to agenda item three, which is named substitutes, if any. Have we any named substitutes been notified to you? Uh, yes, Chair. So we have Councillor Norman, the Cabinet Member Education, Attainment and Skills, has been appointed in the in absence of Councillor Crockett. Uh, we also have the following that have been nominated as substitutes, but they are attending virtually. Uh, they are able to participate in the debate but not able to vote. And they are Anna Davidson, the Assistant Director of Prevention for the Chief Fire Officer, Jonathan Price, David McAfee, the Director of Integrated Care System, but NHS, Herefordshire and Worcestershire, CCG, Simon Trickett, uh, Sarah Duggan, the Chief Executive, Herefordshire and Worcestershire Health and Care NHS Trust for Mark Leeds. Thank you very much. And if we then move on to agenda item four, which is declarations of interest. Uh, do any board members wish to declare any interest in any agenda items? Um, the, the one item I would like to declare is not specifically on the agenda items, it was just to uh, make sure it's documented that I am a member of the Worcestershire Health and Wellbeing Board, just so that it's down there for the record. Thank you very much. So assuming that there are no more declarations of interest, if we move on to agenda item five, which is the minutes of our last meeting uh, and uh, the minutes of the meeting held on the 8th of March 2021 are included in the agenda um, pages 9 to 16 for approval. Um, I just wanted to check that no matters of accuracy have been notified to the monitoring officer uh, so I'll ask board members to confirm that they agree the minutes. So firstly are there any matters of accuracy? No. Uh, and therefore, I will ask board members to confirm that they agree the minutes. Yeah, sorry. That's yeah, sorry, I'm just indicating, your, indicating your approval. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I'm taking it that we are approving the, the minutes of our last uh, meeting, public meeting on the 8th of March. Thank you very much. So I think that's unanimous. Thank you. And then we move on to um, uh, agenda item six, which is questions from members of the public. Uh, members of the public have the opportunity to submit questions in writing to the board ahead of the meeting. On this occasion, no questions have been received from members of the public. Can I just confirm that? Yeah, thank you very much. So if we move on then to agenda item uh, seven, um, which is questions from uh, councillors. Um, and my understanding is there has been a question from councillors uh, that has been responded to. But I would just like to ask, does Councillor uh, Marsh want to add a supplementary question, please? So yes, Chair, uh, Councillor Marsh has asked a supplementary question and that will now be displayed on screen. Okay, I'll read that out. So, Councillor Marsh, uh, I'm particularly keen that we have information on access to publicly available green space. I understand from a presentation by planning some time ago that they were planning on developing an indicator around this. This access is very important to wellbeing and something we understand much better after lockdowns. Please can you update on progress towards reporting on our population's access to green space? And that's for the Acting Director of Public Health. And a written response will be um, issued for Councillor Marsh. Right, so that will uh, come separate to the yeah. meeting. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. So I'm hoping that deal will that will deal with Councillor Marsh's uh, question in due course. And I'm not aware of any other uh, questions from councillors, just to confirm. So thank you uh, very much. And if we then move on to agenda item eight, which is Heritage and Worcestershire learning from lives and deaths of people with learning disability um, uh, called HW Leder. Uh, and it's the annual report uh, 2020 to 2021. The purpose of this item is to receive the HW Leder annual report 2020-21 and to seek the support of the board in implementing the recommendations. Can I invite Rachel Skinner, Associate Director of Nursing and Quality for NHS Herefordshire and Worcestershire Clinical Commissioning Group to introduce the report, please? 
Thank you, Ian. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to bring this report to the Health and Wellbeing Board to raise um, awareness of this really important group who is a relatively small part of our local community, but can teach us an awful lot about health inequalities um, that can be addressed by our, our wider system and the action that we can take to address health inequalities. Um, so I would like to take both the report and the, the front sheet for the report as read, but there were a couple of things that I'd just like to highlight before um, anybody wanted to raise any questions. So um, in particular, because this report um, reflects the 12 months, which covers almost the, the whole of the initial part of the pandemic, particularly wave one and most of wave two, um, I know that people will be really interested in how uh, the COVID pandemic has impacted people with a learned disability. And we've been in a, a strong position that we have, have not had a, a single uh, confirmed COVID uh, death for somebody with a learned disability within Herefordshire. Um, we haven't either had um, a report of excess deaths in Herefordshire for people with a learned disability. Uh, and this is something that we've discussed in the, the Adult Safeguarding Board a number of times, and is something that collectively I think we should be um, proud of. You know, we've worked collectively to support people with a learned disability, and um, the outcomes have generally been good. Um, because this report reflects the third full year of data that we've had, and the first year that we've really had um, better data for Herefordshire and for Worcestershire, we're in a, a different position in terms of being able to understand the context for people living in Herefordshire compared to other areas. So that's given us some helpful reflections this year, in particular that's reflected in the, the front sheet, um, the mean age of death as an example for men uh, is, is quite um, significantly better than the England average. The percentage of younger people, particularly age 24 and younger, with a learned disability who, who die within Herefordshire is better than the England average. There's some interesting data around underlying conditions, which we hope to investigate in more detail when the, we look at the, the, joint, um, the joint needs assessment. The paper also reflects the priorities that we've now been able to formulate. And I guess something else that's really important to say is that this programme is a quality improvement programme. It's very much founded in listening to and working with um, experts with lived experience in our local communities to understand their perspective. Yes, to take the learning from uh, the sad notifications of deaths that are reported through, but also to take people's experience and build on that to improve outcomes for, for everybody. Um, so the, the priorities that are highlighted within the annual report will be taken forward into a strategy that as a, a system we're required to produce by March next year. It will be a three-year strategy and that will provide much more detail of how we're collectively working together to improve outcomes for people. Um, so I would, uh, I'm happy to take any questions that anybody has at that point. Can I, on behalf of the, uh, the uh, Health and Wellbeing Board, thank you, Rachel, for um, both the huge amount of work that you and others have put into uh, preparing this report, and also the um, strong focus that it makes on dealing with matters of inequality, which we know have become uh, um, uh, very, uh, uh, even more important at times of COVID. So uh, the fact that you've been able to give some uh, important information on how Herefordshire has dealt with one of its most uh, um, uh, potentially vulnerable um, communities, uh, I think is uh, very welcome. So can I thank you and others? Um, so moving to the wider board, um, are there questions or comments that people would like to make on the work as presented here? Can 
Thank you very much indeed. Yes, thank you for this report, Rachel. Um, I just want to focus a bit on. Um, I don't quite know how, how to put it, but the sort of social side of care and support for people with learning disabilities. And for example, you have one of your priorities is focusing on obesity. And um, clearly obesity, um, along with mental health and probably a few other things, can be addressed in part by opportunities to exercise, walking, open air, fresh air, all those sort of things, which we've, we, you know, we touched on a bit earlier, actually. Um, so I'm just wondering where we would make those links, where that would be built in. And forgive me, I have not read all a tax report. Um, but um, uh, for example, um, you know, in Lampster, where I live, we have fantastic programmes for people with learning disabilities. And they're probably as independent as, as it's possible to be. They, we have Walking for Health is, is a, a really fantastic programme, very supportive, actually led by some of our people with and disabilities. Um, another example, just by chance, um, we have a very active litter picking uh, group who often meet or meet regularly on a Sunday morning, and members of our learning disability community come out and do that. It's it's communal. They love to come. One in particular works with me. Loves to come. He really misses it. He misses it if he's not able to come. And it's. It's just good for anyone who is out there, me included, to be walking, doing something useful and connecting people in the community. So I'm just wondering where, is there a particular focus on that that can be built in or is built in? Um, it may be there, but I haven't located it. Yes, of course. So the, the, the strategy will go into much more detail in terms of how we are taking the priorities forward. I, I think we would all very much see being part of the wider um, the wider health and wellbeing strategy for obesity and, and why, you know, I really welcome this report coming to this meeting is that we, we, we all want people with a learning disability to be part of the mainstream conversation. So when we have themes that arise from reviews, we take those themes to what we call a learning into action group that's um, represented by all agencies um, from health and social care, public health, family carers, uh, people with lived experience. And that's where we have the conversation about where, you know, how we can best take priorities forward. And I would expect the kind of examples that, that you've spoken about there to be included in the action plan um, in, in terms of how we can promote. We look at where there's aspects of best practice or good practice. We look at where there are gaps and then we develop an action plan that spreads what works well and thinks of solutions where there are gaps. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Ian, Ian Stead. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to, to support this. Um, it's a really helpful document, something that we strongly uh, support going forward. Um, it's a really important community that needs looking after uh, we are closely involved in various committees that support this and, uh, you know, we continue to do that and we look forward to the right kind of investment going into this in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Toynbee. Yes, I didn't want to jump in before. Were you particularly looking for that one on the screen. I don't know. No, no, no. 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 There isn't anyone at the moment. No, we're okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, no, um, yes, yeah, so thank you very much, Rachel. It, it's really helpful and useful, especially to know how closely and deeply you're working with the people affected and their families. Um, on the inequality, it, this relates back to the councillor question that we had from Councillor Marsh as well. Um, I would... I would like us to talk about poverty rather than, to sometimes use the word poverty rather than inequality or fuel poverty or food poverty, because I think the problem is poverty and we shouldn't be afraid to, to say it. Um, I, I just have two questions. One was, I'm sorry if I missed this when I read, if you're working with the hospices at all. And secondly, if you have um, enough resources to do everything you want to do. Yeah, so on the first question, we, um, we work really closely with the end-of-life um, 
network across Herefordshire and Worcestershire and the hospices are a key part of that. Um, we really welcome this year some uh, accessible information that's that's become available for the Respect programme. We um, those who have who have who have seen the the full body of the report will see that we are in Herefordshire in a great position in that um, we we may be one of the the best areas in the region for people not dying in an acute hospital bed. Um, we've had a number of examples where people have utilised hospice beds appropriately or have been supported to have really good end-of-life care at home. Um, we want to learn much more about how uh, that has been enabled actually to be able to share it within Worcestershire too. Um, so hospices are not directly linked into the LEADER programme but are part of a group that we have regular conversations with and share learning with on that point. Um, in terms of resources, I think everybody, um, you know, would say that every, everybody would like more resource to be able to do more. I think we work really well together to make absolute best use of the, the resources that we have available to get the best outcomes for people. Um, there is a review coming up. There's, there's a national policy that's been published a few months ago that's new. We've not had a national policy on the leader programme before. So there's a number of areas that we need to review to put a firm plan in place by March next year in terms of how we're resourcing the programme as opposed to how we move forward um, with the outcomes. But commissioners are, are very much involved in, in the conversations to make sure that the the resources go to the right place to address the priorities that we have. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No? Oh, I think we're moving then to um, our recommendation. And if I just read the recommendation that we've got, um, firstly, um, is that Herefordshire Health and Wellbeing Board notes the Herefordshire and Worcestershire learning from lives and deaths. People with learning disabilities annual report for 2020-21 and the programme's key findings for people with a learning, uh, learning disability in Herefordshire. Does the board wish, um, in addition to that, to make any further recommendations? So firstly, on that first one, um, are, are we happy to, um, for those in the room, our voting group, are we happy to go with that recommendation? And then secondly, just to give you an opportunity to think about, does the board wish to make any further recommendations? So on the first recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it's unanimous then. Yeah. And then does the board wish to make any further recommendations? Because I, I, I have seen almost moving from, uh, and I'm, I'm going to think about this very carefully, what I say, but obviously a bit like previous inquiries, for example, into um, maternal deaths or perinatal mortality, they start with a very hard endpoint, which is death. It's a very specific event in, in uh, all of our life's journey, but actually often the learning is on things that are much wider than that, i.e. people's start to life, or the stress that they're under, or um, smoking, or adverse uh, childhood experience, or other things that may contribute to the fact that somebody uh, has ended up with a very hard endpoint and perhaps a very premature hard endpoint of death. So, with that picking up the themes, perhaps that I've heard uh, certainly from from um, uh, our councillors in the room. Is there anything that we want to go further on in terms of that, um, I suppose, upstream and preventative um, uh, approach in, in terms of uh, those things that might determine something later on? And notwithstanding the fact that, obviously, we've seen some very good examples of good practice from what's been described to us. So I'd just like to ask our councillors or others whether they wanted to make any additional recommendations at this time. I'm just wondering whether we do need to add in a little bit about the, 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 the social outcomes, the, you know, the sort of emphasis on the need for um, you know, um, opportunities for exercise and walking for health. And, I mean, there's such a range of them that I think it's probably a fairly general recommendation, but 
and I haven't got the words for it, I'm afraid, can put some words together that kind of emphasise the need to really support those opportunities and the, the benefits that they will have for a, a, a range of health and well-being, including mental health and including addressing obesity, which is a particular focus within the report. So with that in mind, I mean, let's see what um, John thinks, but could, could we uh, look at um, uh, opportunities for collaboration between the uh, led, led a working group and uh, the, uh, the work of uh, the Health and Wellbeing Board in Herefordshire, but I think this may apply in Worcestershire as well, so I'm just not losing the opportunity to work as a system, uh, look at the opportunities for upstream and preventative information, uh, 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 interventions um, around um, health and wellbeing, e.g. Um, exercise, um, uh, mental health and wellbeing, uh, and other examples. Would that be something that would be that captures what I want. Would that capture? Would you feel that? Would that capture some of what you were? Yeah, I mean, I'm always a bit wary. You know, people set up steering groups to try and focus in on something, and then, and then sometimes we tend to kind of broaden it all out to cover everything again. But you know, I, I probably don't know enough about the actual structures to, to know what would be the most efficient and effective. This one, like Becky, might yes, well, focus that one a bit more. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think it's a really good suggestion. Thank you. I, and I wonder if it's something around um, that sort of. Uh, full participation, isn't it? And everything that we can do as different organisations and different partners to enable people to have that sort of full quality of life and full engagement in society and, and you know, that contribution, which then enables that sort of, you know, that sort of activity, that participation, um, really. So, yeah, I would do totally, totally concur and agree with people. Um, and I wonder if it is that sort of upstream in terms of prevention and um, uh, and, and participation is that good? participation useful word. So, it's all, uh, so it, what we're uh, what we're starting to do is, is Nikki Kelsey talk, talking to what if I got it right is to link the um, uh, the uh, issue of inequality with actually opportunity um, and actually um, uh, max, maximizing the opportunities for um, uh, uh, upstream and preventative approaches in all of our communities um, because. What uh, perhaps the reason this piece of work has been done is that there has been an observation that the disability and autism community may not always have had all of the opportunities that may have been avail available to the wider population. Perhaps that gets us somewhere close. Putting all those bits together, does that does that make sense? Of well people come to that? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just trying to um, chair it, coordinate it. But um, it have been very valuable com contributions both uh, in the room uh, and also. On, on, observations and our presenter outside the room. So um, uh, are, you, are, you, are you there, John? Is, is that crafter? I, I will, I'll give it a try. Yeah. Uh, so uh, other recommendations then are that the board encourages a range of opportunities for collaborative working between the leader working group uh, and uh, the health and wellbeing board be looking at upstream um, uh, prevention and participation opportunities. Comfortable with that? I captured it. Yeah, do we, we need to have a proposer and a seconder? Proposer Councillor Norman. And seconder Rebecca. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. a, a vote. Are we all in favour? Yeah. Unanimous. Um, and um, uh, just wants to check with Rachel and those who weren't in the room. Um, Will, will that give some additional support to the initiatives that I know that you uh, would want to pursue anyway? Yes, very much so. I mean, I, I know that, that people with learned disability are reflected in the Health and Wellbeing Board strategy for Herefordshire, but I think the, the more that we can ensure that people with learned, learned disability and autism are um, considered when thinking about wider health and wellbeing work streams, um, we'll then be in a really good, strong position to get it right for, for every aspect of our local community. So, yes, I can work closely with public health and others to make sure that, that learning is reflected and there's a, an ongoing two-way conversation. So thank you. I know you'll work very closely with experts by experience and carers because that came through the entire report. Um, so just drawing that to a close before any final comments. Um, so a huge thank you to um, uh, Rachel and the team for the uh, large amount of work that's been captured in, in yeah. this comprehensive document. And I hope we're able to add some 
uh, value uh, in, in terms of the uh, upstream and preventive approaches that health and wellbeing boards can contribute to the important work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And then if we move on to uh, agenda item nine, which is the carers strategy. The purpose of this item is to consider the draft carers strategy for 2021 to 2026 and to seek the support of the Health and Wellbeing Board in implementing the recommendations. Can I invite Ewan Archibald, Interim uh, Assistant Director, All Ages Commissioning, to introduce this report, please? Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, yes, what's before you, and obviously this document is a draft care strategy to take us from this year to 2026. It would replace the current strategy, which was set in 2017. Um, so uh, this strategy is a product of very significant and widespread engagement with carers and with other stakeholders uh, over the course of the second half of the autumn and winter of 2020 into 2021. Obviously the form of that engagement had to be adjusted to reflect the COVID emergency, but nonetheless, an engagement was widespread and included focus groups on carers, uh, engagement with young carers and young adult carers, uh, a working group of stakeholders involved with making Google and a number of other bodies and the public survey uh, online. So the, um, the current strategy, the proposed new strategy picks up where the current strategy leaves off um, and uh, also included in the documents is a review of the current strategy and progress made against it um, in relation to um, the vision set out for carers in the new strategy is to improve the lives and experience of heritage carers by recognising, valuing and equipping them to carry out their caring role whilst enabling them to keep well and live their own life. Um, there are some overarching themes and um, other considerations which are set out in the strategy in addition to five priorities. Those overarching issues include very much adopting and taking forward the strengths based approach, which is used more widely, obviously, uh, by Heritage Council and its partners uh, locally, in, particularly working around our health social care, but with other user groups. Um, and this uh, also reflects on the significant work within our talk community initiative and the potential benefit and impact that brings for carers. And so the strategy adopts uh, the, the three questions now essential to the talk community initiative. Uh, in this context, those questions are uh, what can carers do for themselves? What can carers do for the, in their community? And what can their community do for carers? Um, the two overarching uh, cross-cutting themes uh, identified in the strategy are Think for Caring, which is a national concept now but one that was developed and explored in the current strategy now ending um, and is explored further and more widely here. And this is about all organisations, services, professionals and volunteers working across the system and across sectors to whenever they're dealing with the public or supporting a vulnerable person to think that they may be a carer or to think that person will have a carer and to think about the implications of what they're doing for carers and the needs of carers and the strategy they may have in any situation. The other overarching theme is around technology and the great opportunity that the use of various modern technologies provide to support carers, not only in their caring role, but they're also in living as independent lives as possible themselves as carers. Uh, the, Strategy has said box five key priorities, um, and those are the carer's voice, the representation of carers, services provided to support carers, the role of carers in the community, carers' health and well-being, and carers' financial uh, stability and well-being. Um, so some of these are continuations to some degree in a slightly different form of, of priorities in the previous uh, strategy, but there are a number of new emphases here. And the bringing together of themes we think are more here at West, particularly around health and well-being, that being both physical health and mental well-being. Um, and uh, a new element in this, this strategy is the focus on financial um, stability and well-being for carers. Um, that we, there was some hesitation and engagement to uh, consider whether this should be included in a local strategy because many of the factors affecting 
finance as compared with our national natural taxation policy, national um, uh, funding arrangements in terms of benefit system and so on. But it was felt it was so significant for carers that it also interlinks with all the other priorities that it should be included. And there are some you know, proposals in the strategy for how um, things can be taken to some degree, particularly in focusing on the corporate employment of the relationship. Uh, in relation to implementation of the uh, strategy, it is worth underlining that basically the entire content of the strategy is the product of that engagement. So everything in the strategy is coming directly from carers themselves with lived experience, uh, carers organisations in some cases, and other key stakeholders, including uh, uh, public sector and other and voluntary and community bodies. Um, in terms of implementation, it is proposed to establish for the first time in Herefordshire a new carers partnership board which will be regularly and comprise a mix of uh, carers themselves with the experience of caring, and also other key stakeholders, commissioners and providers in various sectors. Um, and that will be regularly with a broad agenda, but with a particular focus on implementing this new strategy. It is proposed, if this board is willing to accept the challenge that uh, there are regular reports of this board, and the board is given the opportunity to review and check progress generally in relation to this strategy. Uh, there, it's also been requested, um, certainly by the uh, adults, uh, current adult scrutiny committee within the council, to have regular reports and to have the opportunity to review the strategy regularly. And we believe that also the children's scrutiny uh, committee will adopt a similar approach and will see regular reports. Um, this draft strategy is due at the moment to go to the council cabinet for consideration in September this year. And all in well, and after it has been approved by the cabinet and other organisations, uh, we will proceed to publish it during the autumn uh, on the council's website and in a variety of different media, ensuring that that includes easy read and other accessible formats. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ewan. So, um, if we could throw that open then for discussion, I'm sure um, uh, Ewan will be happy to take any questions either of detail or of um, further. Um, comments or, or queries. Instead, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the report. Seems very positive. Again, this is something that we strongly support. Just a couple of particular points to make. One is that um, I understand the need to have the strengths based and community based. Uh, outlook, but funding for this is also very important, and we would not want to see the Herefordshire funding uh, significantly different or out of line from Worcestershire or uh, neighbours on this. And then on a particular area of carers, um, children carers, child carers, there's so much evidence that they lose uh, out on their futures by losing school attainment and having a reduction in their possibilities for further education and careers. And so any support that they can be given through education and children's departments and uh, any of the other um, third sector assistance on this uh, would be uh, very much welcomed. Thank you, Ian. Yes, I'm happy to answer that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ian, for your um, comments and questions. Uh, in relation to funding, there are no plans arising from the strategy to reduce or, or otherwise change the funding currently provided to carers locally. Uh, the approach in Herefordshire is somewhat different to, uh, to the, the way that we strategically approach spending on adult social care generally, and that arises particularly from the strength based approach, the particular development of the strength of tool community. Um, and so on. Uh, so, given an emphasis from that, you will see in some other uh, like authority areas, including those bordering us. Uh, but uh, that, that isn't got to particular relation to carers, that's just a, a, a general approach that Herefordshire has. In relation to young carers, obviously, uh, the Council and all its partners are very seized by the importance of uh, working to continue to identify and support in as many ways as possible, especially vulnerable groups of people in society. Um, during the life of the current uh, strategy, uh, the council uh, invested in developing a new service provided in-house through our 
the uh, early help of family support and held into our Trimble Families Directorate. It's been established now for a number of years, and that is um, improved services for um, uh, young carers by adding to them. So this complements existing activity that's provided in the third sector, which has been running for some years, including a service first established by the Ben Heritage Carer Support and now supported and operated by HBOS. Um, and in, uh, in the past, there have been other groups that uh, existed for a period uh, and in some cases been funded by the council on a grant basis. The uh, additional service that's provided in house has a particular focus on whole family assessment and links to wider work that the council does around supporting families in that whole family approach. Uh, it's a very complex form of assessment and it connects very effectively young carers uh, with uh, not only their education, but also primary care, uh, potential training and employment opportunities as they get older, and social opportunities. But the existing groups provide in the third sector obviously provide a lot of social support and other moral and general support to young carers into their 20s. And I think some of those groups now work up to the age of 25. So there's a continued emphasis with young carers on working with schools to identify and support young carers, but also with primary care and GP practices to identify and support young carers when you can. And so that work continues. Um, and as in previous young carers are addressed, not as a separate or discrete group, but as a key priority across all the priorities and, and overarching themes within the strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. That's very helpful. Thank you. Councillor Swindlehurst. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. So, um, Councillor Swindlehurst, Chairperson of the Adults and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. Um, this strategy did come before the Scrutiny Committee, so um, I'd just like to say a few words about that. Um, I think uh, overall the committee very, very much minded to... Uh, acknowledge the importance of carers uh, and the importance of this strategy and were supportive uh, of the strategy. The, the recommendations which have been um, accepted uh, or in, in totality, um, so I won't, I won't summarise them, they're, they're at uh, Appendix C in the report, um, but, but they sort of thematically grouping around uh, implementation and monitoring, um, continuity, inclusion, and coordination. Um, the, the committee was also um, very grateful for the direct input of, uh, during the meeting of experts by experience and, and note um, the, uh, the ongoing role of experts by experience in, in, in not only the, the, the uh, uh, drawing up of this uh, strategy, but also the partnership board, which is, um, I think, really, really, really good. And the, the, the committee were very pleased to see that. Uh, the committee were also um, very pleased to note the, uh, the, the the depth and breadth of consultation um, around this strategy, which which uh, I think has has made it a, a better document. Um, and so, all, all praise to um, uh, the, all that work that that has gone into it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the kind words from the council, and certainly both scrutiny committees have been incredibly supportive throughout the journey of this. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Ewan and the team and all the stakeholders that have been involved because um, even during the pandemic where you would imagine contact was difficult, the consultation and engagement in, in this strategy has been perhaps even stronger than during a period when we could meet face-to-face -face and have public meetings, etc. cetera. Um, the list of partners and, and, and consultees is extensive as acknowledged by Council Sumnerhurst. Um, and also, of course, this takes us into a new um, area for the system in that um, all age is becoming standard as approach. So children and adults are interchangeable and, and, and complementing each other. And that's definitely a move that the council is making, but also the system is beginning to embrace, absolutely. Um, and of course, this takes us into another area of, of development in that this will be the first care strategy that is published and progressed as part of the ICS. So, of course, there's a very system approach to this issue now, which, of course, you and, um, and the team will embrace. And, and no doubt, whilst we continue to update scrutiny committee and health and wellbeing, we will continue to also involve the ICS and update ICS in terms of development, because, of course, care strategy cannot be delivered without partners. And, of course, we, uh, we embrace that. So uh, I think it's a great piece of work, and I, and I welcome it coming to health and wellbeing board 
um, and I do believe it will deliver a much better um, position and support for the carers in the UK, which are, of course we are, we are incredibly proud of and, and, and incredibly reliant on to ensure that the system uh, does continue to sustain. Thank you very much, Paul, and you, and because actually you are you identify looking at the expert uh, by experience angle or the end of the telescope, actually the importance of they see one system. So actually they don't understand sometimes why um, they fall down um, chasms, let alone cracks. So the philosophy of this approach is it, 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 uh, from, uh, I'm sure from a um, user perspective must be very welcome, um, let alone the enormous commitment to doing it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you, Ewan, and, and everyone else who's been involved. This is very comprehensive and, and very well pleased with Bertram uh, Orders. Um, and I think particularly the fact that it has the breadth of consultation that's taken part, I think that particularly is encouraging and I'm very pleased to hear it. Um, when I first uh, saw this, which must be some months ago, the initial, uh, I can't remember it was now, which meeting it was, I did raise the point about young carers in particular. And it's really encouraging to see how much that is part of this. That's a very positive response from Ricky Turvey, I think it was, at the time. So that's really encouraging. But there do still seem to be, um, thinking particularly children, but probably across the board, uh, unawareness, you know, employers, possibly occasionally teachers. And that's still a, you know, an ongoing thing, I imagine, to try and make sure everyone, the, the think carer sort of element in this is really important, isn't it? Um, because there obviously are, and you've got a few quotes which sort of highlight this, hopefully not too frequent. Um, employers who are not terribly sympathetic or aware and able to give that extra bit of leeway or support where it might be needed. And, and likewise, uh, perhaps school is where a child is struggling a little bit. And if the awareness of home situation isn't clear, then that could be problem, problematic. Um, the board sounds uh, really look forward to hearing how that develops and who, who's on it. Um, and also, the other thing I'd like just to mention is this idea of exchange of skills and thinking. So, you know, if you have a, say, a young person supporting an older person, it's a really nice thought that sometimes that could be, um, you know, there could be a sharing. So, if you're helping an older person with their shopping, whatever, they might be able to give you some help, just for one fairly classic example with history. So, talking about the war years or, or the earlier years or something like that and I've heard of young people supporting older people with developing IT skills and things like that so I think there's great potential there and it's good for both partners if you like to feel that both contributing in some way it's not all a, a one-way situation so I think there's lots of possibilities but the report very very promising thank you. Thank you, Councillor Norman. In fact, what you remind us all of is that in, in this room are uh, you know, representatives of the public sector who actually are employers and actually our um, duty of care to our own uh, workforce, all those that we commission. So actually, it's a, a very welcome reminder of that key role that we play as, as leaders, employment leaders, setting example by example. So thank you. Any other questions or comments? It follows on for that, but I was just wondering is there anything further that in terms of uh, support from, from members of the board that would be helpful that implementation and, and the um, uh, building of the, um, of, of the group we've got to take it forward? Quite a good point. Um, I think that um, I, I think yes, and perhaps through the ICS as well, doing that to ensure that we've got the buy at the appropriate level to support that function in the wider. Yes, yeah, that's a good idea, and I do wonder whether the terms of reference for that board could come through through the health and wellbeing, and certainly that through the RCS. So the partners are signed up to the terms of reference of that board because, of course, it is a big key to with the strategy, and of course, we want that to be inclusive as well as um, to be with lived experience, but also. Have care is to be represented in as many parts of the system as possible. So, some of the reference could go back to the one eight board. Okay. Jane Ives. Thanks, um, uh, Ian. Just a, a couple of points, really. Um, uh, I guess the first thing is in terms of the. 
um, evaluation of the uh, previous strategy. And there doesn't seem very much data in that. There's quite a lot of some carers say. And so, and so it's quite hard to get a handle on actually where we are now and what our baseline is. Uh, and then I guess the second thing, I mean, I mean there's nothing uh, not to like. I mean, all of the things in the strategy are great, but then there's sort of no resources attached to it. And, there, and it does tie us into doing quite a few, few things. And it may well be these budgets exist in other areas, but you know, tailored advice for carers and respect to employment training and volunteering, that may be a service that exists, but is it, or is it one we've got to set up? Access to free personal protective equipment for all carers, is that already in place or is that new? Uh, and then particularly from um, uh, annual checks for both people who are cared for and the, uh, uh, and the sort of a inquiry about how, they, how their carer is. And again, if there's potentially 21,000 carers in the county, that's actually quite a lot of work. And is that new or is that already taking place? So I'm a bit unable to judge what we're already doing out of this and what's new. And if there are really new things in here, the suggestion that there isn't any resource attached to that might, um, might mean we don't deliver what we, what we are setting out to do. James, so I don't know that you and all yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, certainly I'll answer a bit. So, last PPE, yes, that's already provided available as part of the council's PPE offer. And the uh, number of carers uh, support the number have already been taken out up during the um, pandemic, uh, and that will continue to make that available as far as it's required. Um, in relation to um, health checks, it's worth um, pointing out that the the 21,000 number comes from the census, and it is a, it, it's based on a very low bar for caring. So it's basically any individual who identifies their provider in one hour or more a week. Um, it is impossible to estimate with entire certainty exactly how many there are carers that I know which are with a very significant care load. It's thought to be more in the region of 11 to 12,000 people. So it's still a significant number of people. Um, for instance, in relation to COVID vaccine, I'm confident that in the region of um, 10,000 carers will often uh, vaccinate a um, very high take-up rate. Um, so those are probably more accurate numbers. I think there are, example, there are many GP practices and they can already do this, and it's considered you know, good practice in many respects. Um, I think we'll want to just explore uh, with our private care and community health partners in Phoenix and White Valley how we can build that tape up and get more granular information about uh, the, the numbers taking that up. Uh, I think you pointed out numbers are a fair one, and I'm happy to follow up with you, Jane, in terms of fairly particular numbers in terms of the current baseline position that you're doing. So there is some more data available in that summary. Thank you, Julian. I don't think you've got anything for all. And I was going to come to the same sort of point that the PPA has been been in place for at least nine months and we've got quite a good take with that and it's, it's quite regularly distributed so yeah. and we've no plans to, to cease that for some time. Thank you. And did Becky want to come in on the subject of health checks? I know it's a <laughs> topic that, um, uh, that, that certainly will pass your desk periodically. <laughs> It's not, it's not health checks as such, is it? It's check-ins. Uh, well, I know, but that's why I'm getting at, because I think that the, the, the use of the language gets quite quite yeah. doesn't it? So, I mean, the reason that I, I was going to ask that is, is there any evidence that, um, and I'm asking for James figure, figures, I, figures uh, because it is spoken about, but it's the figures, uh, uh, as to the take-up or lack of take-up by carers of opportunities for health checks, because they often are at least the start of a check-in conversation, aren't they? Because they're a very fixed point that, that's offered you know, uh, to our community. Yes, I don't, I don't know the figures off the top of my head right. in terms of the proportion of carers. I think, I think it is that sort of broader uh, route in, isn't it? So the social prescribing, for example, as well, and that recognition of an early conversation and a, and a route to, yeah, to community and other specifically carer support. Yes, sorry, I'm probably I'm, I'm slightly careless in my language there, so Chair. I shouldn't have said that. So. Yeah, no, no, no. I was, <laughs> I, 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 I was being um, absorbing. But, but yeah, I think this is a broader, it take the, it, it's almost an extension of the making a big point on account for this. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Taking all opportunities from other professionals to the entire community for encountering carers as well as the people that carry. And again, it's partially extension of the thing carers. So 
So how are you? At the same time as I'm you know, talking with you about the, this person that came from how are you in your own health and well-being and making sure that you know taking up keep the check from people are taking up uh, uh, opportunities vaccination and cleaning, for example, that will promote their health and well-being. But it's also about talk community. And I think uh, obviously one of the words is talk community through social subscribers, uh, but also there are many others um, through universal services and through the the wider promotion and branding to the community. So I think all of that contributes to that. Thank you. Any final questions or comments? Councillor Torn. Yeah, thank you. Just very briefly. Yeah, I'm really interested to see um, financial well being in here, <laughs> you inside it. <you're> <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and the very, very final line um, in the strategy is ensure carers have access to advice on benefits, etc. As we all know, a lot of carers don't aren't receiving all the allowances and benefits that they're entitled to. So I guess um, I would just like to know that we're being that we're sort of going beyond kind of signposting and raising awareness and actually being proactive about making sure that explicitly proactive about making sure that people are getting all the support that they're entitled to from central government. Um, I, mean, I think you mentioned training DWP staff, that's great. Talk community obviously has a role, maybe DP surgeries, and maybe us as a board, I, I don't know. There is a number of very important points. Any other questions from Mike, Mike Hearn? Thanks Ian. Yeah, I'm very supportive of you and thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, also keen to understand what the measurables are as we as we move forward. We're really not, not just looking back, it'd be quite helpful to uh, to bring those back. And uh, I guess we've got lots of opportunities to be discussing a different forum that we've got across the system. Um, really a general point I wanted to make really, this is, uh, it just reminds me when we talk around the end of life strategy is, is it's not a strategy in, its, in itself, in, in its entirety, is it? it's separate to others, it's, it's how well it integrates across all other pathways, which is going to be crucial to get right. So one of the key, key things I'd like to understand as we look uh, uh, to, to see um, you know, how well we're, we're, we're delivering this strategy is thinking in terms of all the other uh, um, projects and pathway development that we're looking at is that in the same way as we look at things like prevention and we look at mental health within those pathways we also need to perhaps be thinking about what the implications are for carers so it's just perhaps a uh, something for us to uh, consider uh, how we address that moving forward as well um, so that it becomes part and parcel rather than the kind of uh, nice to have and add on uh, which uh, I, I appreciate that's not where it is, but it's uh, it clearly we could make it more business as usual than we than we currently do as a system. Thank you, uh, thank you for, for that point. I think it's very valid. And just to yeah, go back to council and Tom, we do have the um, Money on Your Mind new website that's just been launched, which is another level of uh, service around um, those sorts of issues. And I think that'll be it's in its infancy now, but I think it will really help, and we are proactively trying to ensure that people maximise their benefit with their revenue. There's, of course, huge benefit to the system of them doing so, and a huge benefit, to, of course, to them as individuals. Um, thanks for that, Mike. And I think it, it does lead us into that conversation where we're going with the ICS to some extent, in that thematics become much more important, so that when we bring an item forward to the ICS and 1H board particularly, and, of course, into the CPF, sorry, the Clinical Practitioner Forum, for, for those who aren't familiar with that body, is that we start to have those themes running through so that when a paper comes and a proposal comes, um, we can consider all those themes that are running through it. Um, and carers is clearly one of those themes that has to be absolutely embedded in anything that we do. Um, and of course, you know, other things such as technology, etc. It, it, it will lead us to that place, I believe. And I, and I would agree with you that it's, it's felt a bit standalone in the past. Um, and now it needs to start coming through as part of the DNA. Um, and I think that this opportunity that we've got um, as we have more of a system approach to particularly carers, um, that, that theme will start to be very strong. Um, it, was always, it was always there, but I'm not sure it was as prominent as it could have been, and now this new approach, I think, will really put it at the forefront. So I welcome that, and of course, the support from, um, from GPs and from the NHS in putting these strategies together and, and delivering it as partners will we'll hopefully deliver that thematic approach, so I think mean, that's welcome. Okay. Yeah. So um, just moving towards um, recommendations then, um, 
Um, we've got a couple of recommendations here that the Health and Wellbeing Board considers the draft carer strategy for 2021 to 2026 as a appendix A by the Adults and Communities um, uh, Directorate and uh, B determines any recommendations it wishes to make to the council or relevant health bodies to improve the strategy and action uh, plan alignment to the health and well-being strategy and or to improve integration between health and social care. So that, those are the clear recommendations. Does the board wish to make any further recommendations at this time? And the only one that I just while people are thinking about, the only one I've heard is, a, a, I think, a very strong focus on system, I think is what I've heard, which may or may not have been, I think it's in there, but I'm not sure whether it's been articulated perhaps as system. I think it's in there, actually, in the, in, in the, in the approaches. Uh, would we want to make any recommendations on system? I'm just putting that, that out. Um, uh, Could we strengthen the second, re second recommendation to make it even more explicit, perhaps? Yes. It, is, it is in there, in that second recommendation. Perhaps it could be sort of more explicit. So you're suggesting something like the action plan alignment to the health and well-being strategy to prove integration as a system between health and social care, something yeah. like that. Just to, just to cut just a couple of words to be quite clear what we're talking about, because I think it is a, a common observation of, um, uh, of, of people who are using the systems it, uh, is sometimes that it's the gaps in the system. And therefore, if that system approach, which has been picked up by a number of people, is in our recommendations, that does, I think, strengthen it, I think, is what I'm hearing. People be comfortable with that. Yeah. But literally, just to add those two words. Okay. Um, Chair, I think there was a recommendation between Becky and Paul about uh, that someone on the Health and Wellbeing Board uh, lends be in terms of reference for the uh, care and strategy of the group. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it, it, uh, 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 are people comfortable with the form of words about the um, formation and membership of that group, or would there? People like to have any additional form of words around that group, um, uh, and uh, I don't know what you, you feel, uh, Becky, as you raised it as a, a very open offer. What other help um, do you need that may not be there in the way it's constructed at present? I think perhaps taking the words that you said. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how far you are with that board. Whether there is any need for that as a recommendation, or whether it's sufficient in terms well, of working. Sorry. Sorry. Work is starting now on that. The idea is that we will have a first meeting with the board towards the end of September. So there is still not need to influence it. And we haven't got, we've only got the draft in terms of reference at the moment. So that could be good. So would the, would the, would the, would the, would the the putting the system in the recommendation actually start to address some of what you might need in that group? Yeah, because it because by putting the word system in it then means that people um, are uh, part of the of the whole, and therefore yeah. if they feel they're not. I think they can. I think that then is I'd like to help you, and I don't see anybody who can bring you that range of skills who's in your existing group and it mentions system. Would that would that be the way of adapting it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think maybe that is captured. Is it, are you comfortable with that, Becky? Yeah. Right. Um, so on the, on the word, does the board wish to make any further recommendations? I think we're just adding a couple of words to be explicit about system. Um, uh, and then please, can I have a, a proposal or seconder for that sort of tweak then that we're making? I'm guessing Paul will, because he proposed it. And I don't know about Council of Norman, because I think it came as the spirit of what you were saying as well, um, uh, and, uh, and Council Tornby. So thank you. Um, uh, so if I now could ask board members to uh, vote, um, uh, raise your hands uh, in favor, of the recommendations. Yeah. That means that there are through the maths and none against no abstentions, I think. So it's unanimous. So thank you very much. And can I just do a huge thank you? I think from the level of debate we've had, I think every every participant in the room realizes the value of this work, the value of carers, uh, and the uh, huge amount of work that's gone out uh, behind this, uh, outside this room, uh, particularly by Ewan and Paul and their, their various teams. Uh, and also uh, the work that's already gone through adult scrutiny uh, with a whole raft of recommendations, which I haven't seen anybody doing anything other than happy with in the content of the discussion we've had. So can I thank Councillor Swinglehurst as well for the work of, of uh, her group um, that comes together very, very nicely. Um, so th thank you.
So we would uh, move on to agenda item 10, which is the Better Care Fund year-end report. The purpose of this item is to review the Better Care Fund year-end 2020-2021 uh, and to seek the support of the board in implementing the recommendations. Um, uh, can I invite Ewan uh, Archibald, Interim uh, Assistant Director, All Ages Commissioning, and Adrian Griffiths, Business Partner, to introduce the report, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. So I'll say some very brief words in introduction and then hand over to Adrian for his years uh, remotely to uh, provide a bit more detail and to answer any questions that uh, members of the board may have. So uh, this uh, report reflects on uh, the year now gone and this documentation has already been submitted uh, and have been accepted uh, by the Department of Health and uh, Coventry is fully compliant with uh, the requirements for this period and we still await uh, specific guidance and FDU requirements for the period we're now in, and that I think is the way of things on to ECF. Um, this year in question was in many years, of course, an unusual year during the uh, it coincided with um, uh, the COVID 19 emergency, and that has had some impact inevitably on some schemes and programs, either uh, starting later or, or not being fully implemented during the period, and therefore some underspends. In the way that we've set up and managed the funds in relation to BCF has been the opportunity to some extent to make use of those on the to move funds from one point to another, and AJ can require explain that in more detail. Um, so uh, it's presented uh, with the detail of the house for your um, review, and I'll ask AJ to have a more summary that he wishes to. Uh, thank you, Ewan. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm Adrian Griffiths. I'm the Council's Finance Business Partner and the Joint Strategic Finance Lead for both the Council and the CCG. Um, and my main responsibility is Joint Commissioning and the Better Care Fund. So as Ewan says, this is a retrospective report um, on the last financial year to confirm compliance with the national conditions for the BCF. Um, so the report confirms that Herefordshire was compliant with the four conditions, um, all of which are fairly broad. As Ewan says, the 2020-21 was a very different year in, in many ways, particularly for the BCF. So in all prior years, we've had to submit very detailed plans, detailed financial plans, narrative plans, um, key performance indicators and our trajectories against them. There was none of that for 2020-21. The guidance and policy framework was delayed and then delayed again and again and then cancelled in recognition of the fact that everyone's effort was going into dealing with coronavirus. Um, so there was no national guidance, no policy or KPIs issued, uh, no requirement to submit any sort of plan, let alone a detailed joint or detailed financial plan. There was no regular reporting as the year went on and no detailed end of year report. There was a brief summary template to submit to um, Department of Health and Social Care, confirming our financial outturn position and some other details. And as Ewan says, that has already been submitted and um, accepted by DHSC. It couldn't come to Health and Wellbeing Board before it was submitted, because as, as is often the case with the Better Care Fund, the, the deadline was quite soon after the end of the financial year and it just wouldn't mesh with health and wellbeing board uh, meeting dates. The, the overall guidance, if you like, in, informally around the Better Care Fund for 2020-21 was to keep everything steady as, as it goes um, and get on with it and make sure you agree a plan locally, uh, which we did between the council and the CCG. I think we're fortunate in Herefordshire that, that our our relationship is, is generally good, our partnership is strong, our joint working is pretty good. We've worked very hard for a number of years to have good relationships. So we were able to agree a plan, we were able to keep things steady. Um, most of the effort in the year naturally went towards um, dealing with the, the pandemic um, and particularly in terms of joint working um, around hospital discharge and the commissioning of care home and home care placements um, on a short-term basis uh, for everybody who needed to be discharged from hospital. That was a big, a big focus, and that's what most of those people who would be involved in BCF work 
were involved in. Uh, the commissioning of um, all hospital discharge placements on a short term basis, um, funded by non recurrent funding from the government, uh, meant that there was a, a, a sizable underspend over three million pounds in long term placements um, across uh, the county because everybody was in a short term placement due to COVID. And we're, we're seeing that unwind now as we've worked through everyone who was placed due to COVID. Um, has been um, assessed, reviewed and placed in, in the appropriate long-term placement or long-term care or whatever meets their needs. So we're seeing that, that kind of underspend unwind now um, as we've moved out of the pandemic. And as Ewan says, there were some elements of the BCF that, that either couldn't be started at all or couldn't be delivered in, on the scale that we wanted them to. Or, or in some cases, there were vacancies within services that are funded by the pooled budget that we just couldn't recruit to or couldn't fully recruit to, again, because of the crisis. So we did have an underspend um, on the total pool budget in the year. It's not a huge underspend in the context of the overall pool budget. It's, it's, it's disappointing, but understandable that we couldn't deliver all of the schemes. And... This year, as Ewan says, because no, no guidance has been has been issued, we're, we're continuing to carry on in the same vein that we have before with schemes focused on uh, community health and social care services and hospital discharge and the sort of um, urgent social care services that are wrapped around that. We're continuing with the work around integrated teams and just continuing to stay steady as she goes um, until advised otherwise, although Informally, the national team that looks after the Better Care Fund are effectively saying there, there will be no major changes for 2021-22. They're expecting it to be um, a one-year policy framework and essentially a, a continue as you are, is our expectation. Uh, in, in the report is uh, the summary of each of the pools, um, which I won't take you through in detail because that will probably be tedious for everybody who isn't an accountant, but it just shows um, the various elements that make up the pooled budget and the various elements where the underspend fell. Um, and I'll just draw your attention to pool seven around COVID hospital discharge, which shows that we spent 11.7 million pounds on COVID related discharge from hospital schemes, um, discharge to assess schemes, uh, which perhaps gives an idea of the scale of activity that we went that we that we managed in the year that we weren't necessarily planning to manage at the start of the year and gives an idea of why there was some slippage. Um, I think I've mostly covered the report and the recommendation is that the committee notes the report and I'm more than happy to ask any questions um, about detail that anybody wants to raise. Thank you very much to uh, Ewan and Adrian for their presentation and for the work that it represents behind the scenes uh, in uh, an extraordinary year, as you um, as you stressed. Um, are there any questions, comments, or feedback for both of our presenters, please? No, I see no no hands raised. Um, oh, well, I, I yes, yeah, Councillor <laughs> Toynbee. Sorry, this, this, this is probably an ignorant question, but I was just really interested about um, no KPIs were issued, no regular reporting, that, you know, that reporting has been less detailed than usual than everything. And this must have saved time and effort. And anything that sort of sounds like us being told to organise ourselves locally and just trusted to get on with it always sounds very good to me. So I'm just wondering if, if this experience... What we've learned from it, if, if it's all pros, if there are any cons, and if it might mean that things will be done a bit differently in the future. Good question. Over to our colleagues. <laughs> uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I even will add to this, no doubt, it's extensive years' experience of better care fund in detail. But um, my view is that it's likely to get more complicated. Okay. Uh, it's likely to be more reporting next year than the previous year has been. Um, this year was an extraordinary year and pragmatically it was very much carry on regardless and do as you need to do 
um, for the sake of the uh, COVID response. Um, but the better care fund is definitely under review and it may come out as a completely different arrangement next year, we're not sure yet. Um, but I don't see that that will lax the reporting requirements. So Adrian might have a different view, but that wouldn't be my opinion. Adrian? Uh, thank you, Chair. No, I, I don't have a different view. I, I think um, the current financial year, 21-22, will probably have a lighter touch than prior to the pandemic, just because everyone is still dealing with um, the aftermath of the pandemic. So I, I think we're probably likely to receive quite anodyne policy guidance with um, some performance indicators, but but not detailed targets that we had previously. Um, as Paul says, the, the BCS has been under review for some time between MHCLG and DHSC, and the results of that review aren't known. Again, from, from the, the national team have a desire to introduce a priority around um, upstream intervention and particularly admission avoidance to the BCF. So at the moment, the most of the, the KPIs that were in existence, most of the drivers are, have been around discharge. Um, and that there's an ambition to introduce um, admission avoidance as, as a driver for the BCF as well, but, but nothing has come out. Um, I, I suspect I've been doing this long enough and I'm cynical enough to think that there will be a return to bureaucracy and targets and KPIs in the future. But at the moment, it's, it's not clear what the future of the BCF might be, if it will be in a different form. And it's not quite clear what the relationship of the Better Care Fund and Better Care generally with integrated care systems is. Previously, Better, better Care was a, a synonym for um, a health and wellbeing board's areas integration plan. But obviously, the world has moved on a lot since then. And it, it's not clear how, how the circle between the Better Care Fund and um, integrated care systems it will, be, will be squared. At the moment, we feel that the, the money will continue for the foreseeable future, um, at least until the, the end of the current NHS plan. Um, after that, we don't know whether it will change form, change direction, but, but for the moment, we're, we're going to carry on as we are. I suppose to answer the Council's original question, yes, it would be really good if there were less bureaucracy and reporting to the centre and more sorting things out locally and doing the right things for Herefordshire. But I, I suspect that, well, I think what we've tried to do in Herefordshire is, is do the right thing locally and do things in the best way for integration. But I think we'll, we will have to, to feed the bureaucratic beast as well in the future. Good. Any other questions or comments? I just wanted to just sort of follow on quickly on that topic, just to get views from our speakers on the speculation that's um, out there yet again on an adult social care settlement and what that might mean for things like the Better Care Fund as the front line between the, um, the two sides of the Department of Health and Social Care, which is in the, in the title, includes in their title. Does that mean that this will take on a new life if um, there is a new direction uh, over the next 15 months, which is being speculated on yet again? Uh, thank you, Chair. I Adrian, uh, add to the, to the response. Um, the genuine answer is, is we don't know because there's very little coming out of the DHSC around this at the moment. Um, but, but it needs to be recognised that the Better Care Fund um, is an incredibly um, important piece of funding, um, which was always seen as sort of in the early days as over and above core funding, but now is a very large percentage of the, of the adult social care budget. Um, and, and both the LGA and the Association of Directors of Adult and Social Care have been making it very clear to central government that without better care fund, adult social care now doesn't work at all. Um, I, and you may know the exact percentage, but it's incredibly high. So it's it's almost now part of core funding. So it's, um, it's not a sort of a a pot of money that's over and above the yeah. core services, it's just funding what we need to do on a daily basis. I don't know what the exact percentage is looking at by, but... Um, I don't, I'm afraid, Paul, of the exact, but it is a significant proportion um, of just the day-to-day -day adult social care budget. It, it supports the 
most of operational social care within the council now, particularly around hospital discharge, discharge liaison, um, urgent social care, but it, it also supports locality teams, um, a considerable amount of talk community activity, the, the county team, the specialists, pretty much any, anything that social care does has an element of better care fund money involved in it. And the, the same is true of most lo local authorities, which is why I think it, it, it might change name and it might change form, but it, it won't disappear because if it, as Paul says, if it disappeared, um, a lot of social care would disappear with it as well. Um, as for the chair's question about the adult social care settlement, I see that has been delayed until the autumn again I, i'm catching up with my emails i was on holiday last week i see a number of stories about um increases in tax or increases in national insurance or hypothecated tax um i also see that the hypothecated tax that doesn't exist yet is subject to a putative raid to fund the nhs staff pay increase at three percent which which is interesting to be top slicing money that you haven't yet um, got so it, it would be fair to say that the, as Paul says we, we just don't know what the future holds um, but I, I think from a Hereford perspective we're, we're we're well placed to respond to it because our, our joint relationship is good which in a way is why I ask the question because it's doing quite lots of things locally as well, so I'm here, which is in the spirit of the question I think Councillor told you about things as well anyway um, I don't see any more hands raised. So I think if we move on to our recommendations um, and we've got here, it is recommended that the Better Care Fund uh, BCF 2020 to 2021 year end template at appendix one as submitted already to NHS England be reviewed and the board determine any further actions necessary to improve future performance. Does the board wish to make any further recommendations at this time? No, I see nothing there. Um, and therefore, I will now ask board members to vote. Could board members please raise their hands uh, for? Yeah. Sorry, proposer and second, seconder, sorry. Um, not Paul, obviously. Seconder, yeah. Councillor Toynbee, I think, got there first. Yeah. Just, I think, by whisker. Yeah. Um, uh, and then if we could, sorry, vote, uh, please raise your hand if you are for the recommendation. Thank you, that's unanimous to me. Thank you, that can be recorded. And uh, could again thank the huge amount of work that's gone outside the room, and particularly in these extraordinary circumstances in trying to ensure that this money does work for the uh, health, well-being, and welfare, and, and um, hopefully integrated um, health and care uh, um, needs of the population uh, of Herefordshire. So that um, is, is something that is encouraging to hear as, as the basis for actually how this money has been deployed over the previous year. So can I thank all those involved in that, that piece of work, uh, which is you know, obviously nothing to do with what's happening in this room, uh, thanks to be passed on, uh, because it really has been uh, an extraordinary year. So moving on to agenda item uh, 11, which is the meeting schedule um, from here on, I don't propose to go through the dates specifically, other than to ask if there are any specific uh, objections to any dates proposed. I mean, if somebody's got an individual issue, that's one thing, but there may be reasons why, you know, it just doesn't work full stop, i.e. There's, there's a mega meeting where um, nobody can attend. Um, uh, and unless I hear that, we'll uh, um, assume that, that people are happy with the dates proposed. But uh, if there's an individual issue, please keep the um, uh, Ben and, uh, and, the, and the Democratic Services Group updated if there are particular individual issues involved. Um, uh, and therefore, the date of our next meeting will be Monday, the 18th of October. Um, and uh, at this moment, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending and for their contributions today and for um, uh, having to uh, cope and deal with the, um, the, the format. So I would like to say a huge thank you to um, uh, uh, Jen uh, and uh, uh, Ben and uh, John for the work they've done in setting up today's meeting. Um, uh, uh, I would um, thank you for bearing with both your physical attendance at the meeting and those who've attended uh, virtually. And 
Um, uh, I apologize if in trying to run a hybrid meeting, I've occasionally strayed slightly from the printed agenda. So that's a formal apology from, from me. And I can't tell you how we'll be meeting on Monday the 18th of October yet, but you will be kept in touch in due course. I would also like before people um, uh, disappear from the public part of the meeting, just to put on record my and our thanks for Councillor Pauline Crockett for her enormous uh, contribution, uh, both um, uh, as a, uh, uh, you know, uh, in her wider roles, but specifically in her role uh, as chair of this group, because I'm sure little did she know when she took it on that she would be um, combining a, uh, an NHS um, uh, realignment around systems uh, with a um, once in a century pandemic and then a, uh, a focus to uh, continuing with both actually at present where we are um, continuing to deal with the consequences of the pandemic in terms of coronavirus but also in terms of the broader determinants of health which actually has been the subject of much of our discussion today has not been focused on the pandemic it's actually on those broader determinants of health which I'm glad to see are absolutely at our heart uh, but also there is the, um, uh, the move to system across the NHS and all that means for uh, the future partnership and relationships uh, across uh, all the various people attending in all the various uh, formats that we're here today. But I would like to thank uh, 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 Councillor Crockett for her work and leadership at this um, uh, um, unprecedented time. So could we please put that on the record? Um, th thank you. Um, and I would now like to close the uh, public part of the meeting as we have a development session to uh, follow. Um, uh, but thank you for those who have been viewing um, uh, the uh, presentation either live or come to it at a future date, because uh, I think it's really important that you see people working in public service on your behalf to make sure that the different bits of the system work um, uh, in the, to the best of their ability using uh, taxpayers' money in our county. And I think today we've seen some really um, important examples of where that joint uh, working uh, has been able to deliver either improvement uh, or uh, offers the prospect of further development and, and improvement going ahead. And I think that's really, really important for everybody who's a citizen of this council. So can I thank you and close the meeting at this point? Uh, and could I check with our democratic, my, uh, the democratic services